Ladies and gentlemen, Snapshot Wednesday is here. Here is a new snapshot for Minecraft Java Edition 1.13. This is 17W45A. My name is Sliced Lime. I'm here to take you on a tour through the new things and the changes in this snapshot. It contains two major changes. Those are a new horse model. You can see it here. It also looks very different when a horse is a baby horse. The other new thing in this version is a brand new command parsing system that is going to take quite some time to go through. So before we get to that, I'm going to go through quickly the other changes and the fixes in this version. It contains a whole bunch of bug fixes as well. The graphical user interface would scale incorrectly in the previous snapshot. And with the fix for that, we got new user interface scaling options. So if you go into the video settings now, you will see that instead of the auto and then named options, you will now have one, two, three, and four and so on. So this should make it easier to find a user interface scaling that works for your screen, especially if you have a 4K monitor or something similar. There are a couple of fixes for rendering problems like chunks disappearing if you switched windows while you were in full screen mode and the underwater and lava overlay was missing. And there's also a fix for the full screen button not making the game full screen. That was a Mac OS specific problem. In addition to that, there's a large amount of bug fixes all related to input not working properly, like buttons not working or keys sending double inputs. Now, with that said, this is the first version that contains Dinnerbones, a new command parsing system. This system is a complete rework of how Minecraft Java Edition handles commands, and it changes a whole boatload of things. Now, before we get into it, some caveats. It doesn't properly work in multiplayer yet. It will work there, of course, down the line, but there's no tab completion or user interface support for it yet. You can type in commands, though. Tab completions overall are kind of a work in progress, they are probably not working correctly and they will tab complete only the most basic things for this version, but you'll see more of that later on. And there are also some changes in this snapshot that are related to other changes that are not complete in the snapshot yet. So some of these changes might not make sense at the moment, but they will make sense later. Another problem to be aware of is that the new commands are not translated in any way whatsoever and they are designed to be translated down the line, better than the current command system, but it's not there yet. Finally, do note that the user interface for typing out command is a rough mock-up. It will probably be cool at some point down the line, is what his notes say, but it's not at the moment, it's a rough mock-up, so don't expect it to be fully done just yet. Now, what are the changes in general then? Well, most commands are case sensitive, more case sensitive than before, so use a lower case whenever possible. If you have something with a mixed case, you have to match the case properly. That is, is the case for scoreboard objective names, for instance. In general, the commands will be faster and more efficient to run, and that especially goes for functions. Why that is, is because functions and commands in general are parsed once and then saved. That means two things. One is that the parser doesn't have to rerun every time you run a command, which obviously saves performance, but also it means that when you load into a level, you will find out immediately if there is any command in there that isn't correct, or at least that has a syntax error. So if you want to find out if some map of yours or some function of yours works in this version, then just load into the map and see what error messages you get. Now with these changes, the way command blocks handle commands have also changed a little bit. The output signal, if you use a comparator on them, that is no longer the success count. It is now the result of the command. So what a command has as an effect has changed a little bit. It used to have blocks affected, items affected, entities affected, success count and a query result. But instead of that, it's now been collapsed into just a result and a success value. Now one thing that has happened in this version is that selectors, blocks and items have all changed to be more consistent and to provide more functionality across the board. For selectors this means that there's now more error handling, so if you have selector arguments that don't make sense, like you're trying to select zero entities, a player with a negative level or a game mode that doesn't exist, then that is a proper error now and will give you an error message right away. Selectors used to be a minimum and a maximum separate value, and that is no longer the case. Instead, there are now range support for all arguments, which means that if you specify a value, you mean that value only, which you would previously have to specify as both minimum and maximum. And if you want to specify a range, you now do that with two periods 
in between two numbers. So level equals 10 dot dot 12, for instance, is level 10, 11 or 12. You can also use that in an open-ended manner, so if you omit the last number of that, that will mean anything above whatever you put in the first, and if you omit the first number, then it is everything below the number you put in last. Now, for specific changes to different selector arguments, the X and Z selector values are no longer center corrected, which means that X equals 0 means X equals 0 and not X equals 0 0.5. They also now support decimal input, so if you wanted x equals 0.5, then you can type in x equals 0.5. In addition to that, almost all of the selector arguments have been renamed to be more easily understood. That means that M is now called Game Mode, written out, and it no longer allows the numerical or shorthand IDs, it just allows the complete name of the game mode. L and LM are now called level, and as before, they are no minimum and maximum values anymore. They are level, and you can use it with a range. R and RM are now called distance. RX and RXM are now called X underscore rotation. RY and RYM are now called Y rotation. And C, the count, is now called limit. And that no longer allows negative values, so you could use a negative value on the C argument in previous version to sort inversely from what the normal sorting order is. Normally you would get a sort order that is from nearest to farthest, and with a negative value on the count you could invert that. Now that is not supported, and instead you can use a sort argument, so that means you can do sort equals furthest if you want to inverse that sort order. There are four different sort orders that you can specify. There are nearest, furthest, and random. Those correspond to the old default value, the old negative reverse, and the random sorting, which is default if you use the at r selector. There's also a new, completely new value. It's sort equals arbitrary, and it is the default value now for at e and at a. And that means basically the game will give you the entity result in whatever order it pleases, what that means is this is a value that you should use if you don't care about the order of things, especially when you intend to do the same thing for all of the results you get. The reason to use this is that it is a more effective way of processing since the game doesn't have to sort all of your entity results. I already mentioned that X and Z can now support decimal input, that goes for Y of course as well, as well as distance, x rotation, and y rotation. All of those can now handle decimals in their input. You can now quote a string to include spaces. So for instance, you can use name equals to select somebody or something with a space in the name. Scores are now specified with a single selector that's called scores equal, and it takes a block of score specifiers as a parameter. So instead of lots of score underscore something underscore min and such, you will now just have scores equals then a block curly braces with a bunch of specified scores inside of it. So for instance, objective equals one or objective equals one dot dot five to test for a range of scores. You can do more than one score at a time inside of the same block by just adding a comma and adding another score specifier. There are some new selector arguments as well. There is an advancement one that you can use to test for players that have a certain advancement. So that's advancements equals and then a block again with values like the advancement name equals true for somebody who has completed the advancement or equals false for somebody who have not completed an advancement. Finally, there's now another selector called NBT and you can give that a block that is an NBT data value to test the entity's data against, or you can inverse that so you can put an exclamation mark and then a block to test that that data is not present in the entity's NBT data. Because you can now specify NBT data inside of a selector like this, there are a number of commands that have gotten their entity data specifiers removed from the syntax. We'll get more to that later on. Those were all the changes for entity selectors. Let's move on to blocks. Whenever a block and data and optionally the NBT data for that block were specified as separate arguments, they are now a single argument. It's a block argument and that it takes a block ID first, potentially with a namespace colon. And if you don't specify that, that's Minecraft colon. So if you just say stone, that's the same as Minecraft colon stone. 
After that, you can have square brackets and specify block states inside of that. That replaces all specification of block states outside of a block specifiers and also all usage of data values. So for instance, you could have Minecraft colon redstone underscore wire and then a square brackets with power equals 15. Also after that, you can specify curly braces and a block with NBT data and that will match or set that NBT data for the block. Both of these are optional, so you can have either one or both, but if you have both, then you have to have the block states come first. If you try to specify a block state that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist with the block, or a value for the block state that can't be applied to that block state, then you'll get a syntax error, which means that that will be a compile time error that you will find out when you load into the world, if the command exists inside of a function. If you're using NBT or state, then in the context of testing for a block, then the, only the states that you provided will be tested. When you set, however, it will set those states and NBT that you have selected and then provide default values for anything else. This is basically what you would expect. And finally, remember that there is no such thing as a block data value in Minecraft 1.13. It's either a different block or it's a block state. More of that change will happen later on in future snapshots. The final specifier that has changed is items. So that's the last thing we'll look at before we move on to specific command changes. So whenever you specified an item and then optionally an NBT for that item, there is now just a single item argument and it looks very similar to the block one in that you can provide an ID and then an NBT block. And the ID again can have a namespace, but if you don't enter a namespace, it defaults to Minecraft colon. So for instance, you could type stick and that will be interpreted as Minecraft colon stick. Now optionally after that you can put a NBT section, a block within curly braces and then put NBT inside of there. You can also leave that out to just have all the default values or to not match any NBT. Works like you would expect and in any command that used to have a specific NBT section for an item, then the syntax has changed to remove that and it's now considered part of the item. There's also no such thing as an item data value or an item damage value in Minecraft 1.13. Damage, wherever it was applicable, has been moved into the NBT of the item. And any other information is either a separate item or a property inside of NBT. Now, for the syntax of specific commands, a number of them have been changed just to reflect all of those changes that we've just gone through. That applies to slash clear, slash clone, slash fill, slash give slash replace item and slash set block. But that is not all of the changes to commands. There are a number of them that have changed as well. The slash advancement test subcommand has been removed because you can now use an entity selector with an advancement equals selector argument to do the same test as that one. A number of commands have been made more strict, so slash default game mode and slash game mode only accept string IDs now, not the shorthands or the numeric IDs. Slash difficulty only accepts string IDs as well, so it won't accept shorthand or numeric values. And slash difficulty also has a new mode where you can use slash difficulty without any arguments to query for which one is the current difficulty. Slash effect has been changed. You can no longer do slash effect and just a name. Instead, you do slash effect and then either give or clear. And if you use the give mode, then you will specify the arguments afterwards just as you did before. If you use clear, there is now an optional effect name that you can give it to clear only that effect. Giving an effect will now fail the command if it didn't actually put an effect onto the entity that you gave. And some mobs, like the ender dragon, are immune to effect. Stronger existing effects, if you have a stronger effect, will prevent a new weaker level of the same effect from being applied and that will then fail the command. Slush enchant has been removed and that will be replaced by a new command called slash modify item. However, that new command is not in this snapshot, it will be in a later snapshot. Slash game rule has been changed to no longer accept any game rule that isn't a built-in game rule in the game. So that removes the concept of custom game rules. And if you were using custom game rules, then you can use functions or scoreboards as replacements. And that should mean that you don't lose any functionality at all. If you have custom game rules, they will be there still in the level data. They just won't be accessible. Only the built-in rules will be accessible. Values to slash game rule are now type checked. And that means that if you give it a string, 
and the game rule that you want to set is something that expects a number, then you will get a syntax error, and that will be reported immediately when the command is compiled, and again, if that's inside of a function, that will happen when you load into the level. Slash stop sound has been improved. Instead of a source, you can use an asterisk to check for and stop a sound with a certain name across all sources. Slash TP is now an alias of slash teleport. So slash TP works exactly like slash teleport. Coordinates are now relative to the executing entity. That is exactly like all other commands work. This has been in progress for a while. So the syntax of slash TP remains but the behavior of it is more like slash teleport used to be. Slash XP has been changed as well, it is now an alias for slash experience, and that has been split up into three different subcommands. You can do slash experience add to add points or levels to a player, and if you add points you can cause players to level up as usual. If you put in a negative number, then you can subtract points instead, and that can make players level down. You can also use slash experience set to set a specific number of points or levels onto a player. If you're setting points, then you are setting points within the current level, so you can't set more points onto a player than their current level allows. When you change levels, the amount of points will stay at the same percentage as their previous level had. There's also a command called slash experience query that can return the number of points or level on the given player, and that will be returned as a result of the command. The exact relevance of the return value will become more clear in a moment here when we get to the changes of slash execute. Before that though, slash scoreboard has had its data tag removed because they're no longer needed. That can be built into selectors now. And a couple of the subcommands for scoreboard are now their own commands. So slash scoreboard team is now just slash team. And slash scoreboard players tag is now just slash tag. In addition to that, slash scoreboard players test has been removed because you can now use entity selectors and a new mode to slash execute. It's called slash execute score to get the same effect. There's also a new command, slash scoreboard players get that you can use to query for specific scores, and those scores will be the result value for that command. Related to scoreboards, the slash trigger command has also gotten a little bit of an improvement. If you just do slash trigger objective, then that is shorthand for slash trigger objective add one. So it will add one to the value of that trigger scoreboard for your own player. More removed things, slash toggle downfall has been removed, you can use slash weather instead, and slash weather has been modified too, so if you don't specify a time, it now defaults to 5 minutes, which was previously random. And I'm actually going to have to double check this with Dinnerbone, as we've discussed this before, and I believe the intention was to have it default to the same behavior as the normal weather switching mechanic has. Again, I will double check that and we'll get back to you with an update either in a future video or on Twitter, so you might want to follow me there. And then there are a number of things that have simply disappeared because slash execute now covers those functions. That includes slash function, which no longer has if and unless optional arguments, and also slash test for slash test for block and slash test for blocks no longer exist at all. That is also true for slash stats, it no longer exists, it's part of execute and you can use a new mode to get a replacement. So, now I've mentioned this several times over, slash execute has been completely redone in this version. How has that been done? Well, slash execute is now followed by a chain of modifier subcommands, then a run keyword, and then the command that you want to run. That means that you can do execute and then a number of different specifiers all at once to change how that command is run and what happens to its result. The previous functionality of execute has been split into several different arguments that are available individually. That means that you have much more control of exactly how a command executes now. Let's go through all of the different execute modifiers that you can have and exactly what they do. Slash executes as and then an entity will execute a command using that entity as the issuing entity, but it will not change the position the command executes at. Instead, you can do that with slash execute at and then an entity, and that will execute the command using the position of that entity, but not change the entity. So if you want the functionality of the old execute command, then you will do something like execute as some selector at at s, and then on from there. 
There's also a new offset modifier, slash execute offset with an X, Y, and a Z, will execute a command using that position, and if the position is a relative coordinate, then that will be relative to the current execution position rather than the entity itself. There's a new align modifier that you will give which axis you want the command to align to. This is a specified way to get a command to execute directly in the center of a block instead of whatever the decimal value is. That also means that no other automatic centering is done anymore. There are a number of conditional subcommands that you can use to prevent the command from running if something isn't true, that is, slash execute if or unless, and that has a number of mode. So you can do if block, and then x, y, and z, and a block specifier to only execute the command if there is a certain block at a certain position. That is exactly the same as what test for block and the execute detect methods used to do before. You can also do execute if or unless blocks and then begin end destination and it's essentially a execute version of what slash test for blocks used to do. You can also do execute if or unless entity and then an entity selector which will only run this change command if or unless, depending on which one you used, that entity selector returns one or more entities. And then you can also do slash execute if or unless score with a target and a target objective and a comparison operator and then a source and a source objective. Which means that you can compare two different scores and only run a command if a certain relation between those scores is true. As a replacement for slash stats, there's a new subcommand as well that's called store. And that lets you store the result of a command into something. So slash execute store and then result or success with a name and objective will take the command that you run and use its result or its success value and store that into a scoreboard objective. And like I mentioned before, result is the result of the command which replaces all of the old stats, affected blocks, affected entities, affected items, and query result. And success is the number of times that the command was successful. If a command is unsuccessful, success is zero, then result will always be set to zero as well. Like with slash stats, the objective of course must exist, but unlike slash stats, you don't need to set it to a value for this whole thing to work, so this should be much easier to use than slash stats used to be. There's a little bit of a difference, the stats version of execute is per command instead of per entity or per block, so the stats will only apply to the one command that you're executing right now, and if you want the results to be stored for more than one command, then you'll have to repeat the execute specifiers. Now. With all of these subcommands or modifiers, you can chain them together. So you can do slash execute as an entity at an entity with an offset and align to the grid if a block at a certain position is a certain block and if an entity exists and if a score is a certain value and then store the result of the executed command into a scoreboard value running a certain command. Most of the time you probably don't want to use all of them, but it is possible to chain however many you want in a row. When you're done with all of your chaining subcommand, then you use a run specifier and then the actual command that you want to run. So if you had something that was slash execute at E, tilde 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 detect tilde 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 stone zero, say stone, then that now becomes execute as at E at at S if block tilde 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 stone run say stone. This is all probably a lot to take in, we'll be returning to this multiple times on the channel as this gets updated and we'll have a very big tutorial for this down the line once the changes are about to be released as Minecraft 1.13. For now though, this is a massive change, it's going to break every single command contraption out there, but the new commands will be so much better than what we had before. And as a sneak preview, I can tell you that there are more changes coming and some of them are highly requested features that will make you very happy, I am sure, for all of you map makers out there. Whew, that was a lot of changes, two commands, and enough for this time. I will mention before we end that these command changes are super, super early. They are probably broken in all manner of ways, so consider this snapshot very, very, very experimental. It goes without saying. Use it on your own risk and do so on a backup of your worlds or on a test world. Now with that said, if you want to try it, head into your Minecraft launcher, 
click the launch options tab and switch on enable snapshots in there you'll get a warning just click ok with that because you do know that these are snapshots and dangerous now head back to the news tab where you can select a snapshot profile from the drop down and run after you do that the game will start with the most recent snapshot or pre-release that is currently this one minecraft 17 w 45 a that was all for this time i hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please help me out in return leave a like on the video my name is Sliced Lime, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.